And uh, we picked up a little bit on the topic that we're going to be discussing now in the first session. And the se this topic for the second session precisely is scalability. Uh, and I'm being joined here by Sara Azubi as well as Mustafa Albasam. Uh, both of them are researchers at, with University College London and they've been working on blockchain for the past couple of years. I believe both of you are doing PhDs. Yep. Um, so one interesting thing I like to ask people is usually how they came to be involved with blockchain because I think in that space especially there's peop a lot of people with different backgrounds and uh, I was wondering how you got into that space and what your main focus right now is. Let's start with Sarah. I mean, I started my, um, my PhD in computer science and uh, first I was uh, interested in like uh, anomaly detection and uh, one of my supervisors at this time suggested to me that I look at blockchain because, you know, what's great with like, blockchain is like everything is public. So if you want to do, you know, some kind of like uh, machine learning anomaly detection, then that's, you know, really easy compared to doing it with like, let's say, financial data where you need to like... Um, you know, get the data from a bank, which is very uh, problematic because it's private. So I had a look at like, blockchains and uh, that was three years ago and I really like loved the technology and then I started working on this and now I'm not doing anything related to like anomaly detection because I just love the tech so much. So I just started um, working <laughs> on this. So that's, uh, that's how I got into it. So this. can you tell us a little bit about some of the projects you're working on right now? Okay, so uh, as part of my PhD, I, um, I've been doing a lot of research on consensus protocol, especially I've been designing a of state consensus protocol uh, called Frontomet that you can find uh, online and um, also Mustafa and I we also wrote a paper that is a systemization of knowledge that kind of like compare a traditional consensus protocol as we were doing them before blockchain with you know now this new blockchain consensus protocol that are very different and especially personally I'm very interested in how we can incorporate game theory um, into security in order to uh, design better sy system because I think that's what uh, uh, blockchains are doing is like they're really using like incentives and economic arguments in order to design better systems. That so sounds, really in this. Yeah. sounds pretty good. And uh, what about you, Mustafa? So um, I kind of became interested in peer-to-peer -peer technology and decentralization even before I heard about Bitcoin or blockchains. So back then there was there was technologies like BitTorrent, for example, and peer-to-peer um, -peer file sharing, and I was kind of interested in that um, from an early age. And so in a kind of how do you create, how do you decentralize things, generally speaking. So then when Bitcoin came about, I was quite interested in that. And I did, um, when I was doing my undergraduate degree in computer science, um, for my final year project, I created um, an Ethereum smart contract to create a decentralized identity management system. Now there's hundreds of them, but this was <laughs> back in 2014, back when Ethereum was only a few months old. You were way ahead of the, of the wave. Yeah, I mean, I thought it was like a original idea, but it, at the time it was, but then it, everyone had that idea as well. That's pretty interesting. And wh wh what, is some of your, what is some of your research focused on right now? And what do you work on in your free time as well? So at the moment, um, my research is focused on layer one scalability. Specifically, how do we actually scale the base layer of, 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 the, of, of a blockchain um, to have more data on chain but without actually decreasing the amount of security that you have on the blockchain and without, without decreasing the decentralization or the decentralization of the blockchain. So for those unfamiliar, basically the scalability issue has to do with the number of transactions that blockchains can process. And it, right now, Bitcoin processes around six to eight transactions per second, and Ethereum can handle between 15 and 20 or something like that. And of course, that's not nearly enough to handle millions of transactions. And I was wondering, what do you think is the main problem with scalability? And then what are the problems with looking for solutions to solve, looking for solutions, you know, to get away with those uh, bottlenecks? Well, I mean, the main challenge of scaling um, a cryptocurrency or a blockchain is that it's not hard to, it's not that it's hard to scale it. It's hard to scale it securely. Like even though Bitcoin can do seven transactions, six transactions per second, if you remove the block size limit and you gave all the nodes in the network gigabit connections, Bitcoin can handle millions of transactions per second. Bitcoin can scale unlimited to, to unlimited transactions per second. What but, would but it wouldn't be central, it wouldn't be decentralized because everyone would have to store all of those transactions. So the challenge is how do you actually scale it while keeping the decentralization of, 
of a blockchain, which is the whole point. Why is that the whole point and uh, what, what are some of the, advantage of the advantages of having a decentralized system? Can you, just for those unfamiliar with the concept, explain that? Well, I mean, there's, there's a lot of uh, debate around this. Why do you really need decentralization? And I think th there's several aspects to it. I think the main aspect, so I would say there's two aspects. One of the aspects is censorship resistance. Um, that is the main kind of uh, goal that decentralization tries to achieve. The fact that you can send money from A to B or do it or, or run the application without having any third party to um, actually censor that transaction or, or, or application. And that also plays into the second point I'm going to make, which is you can create um, applications or transactions that don't have to rely on a third party uh, middleman or a government or a regulator. So you can have completely voluntary uh, transactions or agreements or contracts between two people without having a third party uh, interfere with that or intermediate with that or take a cut from that. So that's, that's good from an from a, uh, ec economic perspective because you, el you eliminate a middleman but it's also good from a social perspective because you, have, it's, you, you don't have a middleman that can misbehave. That's pretty clear. And uh, what about you? I, I'm very curious to know your, your take on scalability and what are some of the main concerns with scaling securely? Well, yeah, I think that um, the problem um, with Bitcoin is like, you know, uh, scale like it's not scalable kind of like inherently due to like this proof of work. Like we require the proof of work, you know, to take like 10 minutes, that's just how it works and that's how we ensure security. So really, I think that if, uh, you know, we want to change that, we really need like fundamental change. So, um, so I think that at the moment in the um, security, um, you know, research community, there are a lot of uh, different ways to do it. So, you know, we have like layer one, Mustafa is, uh, is working on this and charging and things like that. Uh, for me personally, I'm also looking at just like alternative consensus protocol. How can you just like get rid of this proof of work? Because like not only it's not scalable, you know, we have to wait like 10 minutes and then this block, you know, they have a, a, a you know, size limit so we cannot have too many transactions. But also we have this big problem of energy so I think also one very interesting alternative would be to just come up with a new um, like consensus protocol. Um, and then we have this layer two solution that maybe we've heard about. Uh, you know, the idea is like instead of having, you know, um, putting all your transactions on the blockchain, you're going to do like transaction off chain. So, for example, let's say Mustafa and I, we want to, you know, transact together. So we could just do that like on our own and just, you know, put like two transactions in the blockchain that will kind of like settle the final balance where we say, okay, we're done transacting. Um, there is also some kind of like layer, uh, layer zero transactions um, now that are being researched, but uh, I think it's slightly like less popular. It's more like looking at the network level. So I think there are a lot of, um, you know, exciting way that we can change this, but, uh, but I think it's def uh, definitely like a fundamental change uh, that uh, needs to be done to the, you know, the core of the technology. And you already mentioned proof of work mm -hmm. and proof of work for those that might know, not know about it is basically the consensus algorithm used by Bitcoin. It uses, it uses computing power to solve very difficult puzzles and that's how it keeps the network secure. But you're working on another alternative called proof of stake. Can you let us know how proof of stake works and what are some of the advantages? Okay, so yeah, you've explained like briefly proof of work. So the way like sometimes we see it is like in proof of work, there is a leader that is elected and uh, that is like the miner that gets the right to create the block, you know, and this leader is elected proportionally to their computational power because they have to solve this like proof of work computational puzzle. And in proof of stake, you can think of this, of a leader is elected and get the right to create a block proportionally to the amount of stake meaning coins that they have in the system. So it will mean that, uh, for example, someone, you know, that owns 10% of, uh, you know, all the coins, they will be like elected leader 10% of the time. So 10% of the time, they will be the one who creates the new block. So that's, uh, you know, the main idea behind uh, proof of stake. And then the idea is like we won't have to spend all this energy doing the proof of work. And also another advantage that comes with scaling is that we don't have to wait, you know, this 10 minutes in order to produce a block because blocks are just created instantaneously. Uh, and I've oftentimes when I, when I kind of researched proof of stake, one of the main arguments levied against that is that it's not as secure as, as proof of work. Can you touch on those 
on that criticism and explain uh, some of the disadvantages that come with proof of stake and what are some of the main challenges yeah. when it comes to that. Yeah, no, that's uh, absolutely true because as I said earlier, like the security of Bitcoin, it really comes from the proof of work and it really comes from the fact that it costs money to create a block. And uh, so with proof of stake, we have a lot of uh, inherent problems. So for example, there are three famous ones. One is called the nothing at stake. So the idea is that let's imagine that we have a fork, then you know the miners in the system because it doesn't cost any money to create a block, they will just extend each chain. And really, we have no way of coming to a consensus because it doesn't cost any money to create blocks. So, you know, all the, all the forks was flourished. So that's one uh, aspect. There's also grinding attacks. So the idea is like similarly, if it doesn't cost any money to create a block, let's say you are elected leader, like I'm elected leader, I can create like as many blocks as I want and try to like grind through the parameters, you know, tweak them in order to find one that's maybe gonna make me elected leader, you know, in the next round, or it's gonna give me like an unfair advantage over ne the network. So that's also because it doesn't cost any money to create a block. And uh, lastly, there are long uh, range attacks. So the idea is like, let's imagine that we have participants that have created a blockchain and then they just leave the system, you know? So they don't have any more uh, coins, any more stakes in the system. Then an adversary could bribe them, buy the, their, their key that they use, you know, to create the whole blockchain and just rewrite the entire chain. chain. Like similarly, you know, it's not proof of work, so they can just create block instantaneously with these keys and then we'll have a fork. So, so basically they manipulate the record and exactly, then they can... Exactly. Okay, so... so the, that's very challenging indeed. So as researchers, I imagine that one, well, one of the one of the things that you need to do is to pay attention to the rest of the industry and look for the best solutions. And I know that Mustafa, for example, is a co-founder in a company that is working on a on a different concept for a distributed ledger technology, and it's called a directed acyclic graph. Can you maybe explain the difference between a standard blockchain and a, di and a directed acyclic graph and then what are some of the disadvantages and advantages of using a DAG instead, instead of a blockchain? Are you talking about the block mania consensus protocol? The chain... chain sp oh, yeah. So chain space, it's chain space itself isn't a DAG, it's just a blockchain. Oh. Um, it's, it's a sharded blockchain. Uh, which sh so sharding is um, basically a means that you can use to split the blockchain into multiple blockchains that can interoperate with each other and you can do transactions across them. So I guess it I guess it kind of is a DAG, but not not in the same way that IOTA is a DAG for example. Um, so with sharding you can you can it's, it's kind of like at the moment, um, the way the blockchains work right now, if you only have one blockchain, they can only process transactions um, but there's, there's no concurrency there, they can only process one transaction at a time. So it's kind of like running a payment system with one core, with one core CPU. So the idea of sharding is to increase the number of cores or threads in your machine so that you can actually process transactions in parallel and different nodes in the network could actually reach consensus on those transactions. So are there some disadvantages to using that, that approach of solving scalability? Yeah, I mean, I think um, it's. I think I don't think it's like one or the other. I think you need this approach is specific to layer one scalability, um, and ultimately you do need to scale. Uh, like in my opinion, at the moment, the way I see it, sharding is the only true layer one scalability solution. The, the only alternative is to increase the block size, but that's that's going to decrease the amount of decentralization. So with sharding. You can actually make it more m make make it easier for people with less resources to validate the blockchain because they don't have to validate the whole blockchain. They only ha they only need to contribute to the validation of it by validating a subset of the state of the blockchain. So you don't have to run a really. You don't need lots of. You don't need a huge data center to um, validate the blockchain. You can contribute to the validation only with a small computer or something like that. But we do have another consensus protocol. We do have a consensus protocol called Blockmania, um, which is, is which uses something like a a, a DAG uh, to reach consensus between nodes in a between the nodes in a shard. And just but for those that are not familiar with the term nodes, those are basically the validators on a network, the yeah, people that confirm transactions. Yeah. Well, I in this case, I'm referring to the people who are uh, voting on blocks or reaching consensus in blocks. 
So um, it's kind of a, an alternative to Nakamoto consensus. So Nakamoto consensus is basically what Bitcoin uses, uh, which is proof of work plus the longest chain rule. Um, and the kind of drawback behind Nakamoto consensus is that uh, it has slow finality. So you have to wait like six blocks or something to be sure that your transaction won't be reversed. But uh, if the, the really good thing about Nakamoto consensus is that it's very efficient. I mean, to, to get consensus on a block, you only have to send and receive one message as an individual. Whereas there's kind of like these more traditional consensus protocols from the 90s. Uh, one of them, for example, is called Practical Byzantine Fault Tolerance. They, they achieve finality really quickly. Um, but um, they are really uh, not efficient in terms of how many messages you have to send between each node, between all the consensus participants in the network to reach that finality. So with Blockmania or other kind of consensus protocols, like I think Casper is trying to do that, is to kind of try to bring it to mix in the the, the best of both worlds to kind of um, ha have a more efficient consensus protocol, but with to kind of mix the commercial consensus in a way with the, with those traditional consensus protocols to have um, faster finality more efficiently. Okay, uh, and I'm really curious, so from the perspective of scalability, are there some projects in the space that you're particularly excited about and uh, why? Maybe, Sarah? Um, yeah, I mean, so I'm actually quite excited about, you know, the uh, layer two solutions. I think there are a lot of them that are uh, flourishing right now. I think um, there are still like a lot of um, inherent problems with them, but, uh, but I still find that it's, um, a nice alternative, and especially at the moment, there are some that are being like deployed, um, you know, in the real world. So I think it's also nice uh, to see uh, to see like this um, this being deployed. Um, then I mean, I think in terms of layer one, I think like most of the research is really around sharding. I'd be curious to see like you know more. Is there you know other ways that we can. Um, that we, that we can achieve this other, you know, than charging or alternative consensus protocol. I think it would be would be nice to have some novelty. But uh, at the moment, yeah, I think like layer two uh, are quite um, an exciting thing to look at. Um, what about you, Mustafa? Well, I'm quite excited about chain space, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm also generally kind of excited that there's quite a lot of sharding projects now. Yeah, that's true. Um, we've kind of seen the explosion of them over the past year, and they're all kind of trying different approaches and um, different designs. And I think it will be quite interesting to see how, how that plays out and which one kind of comes out on top and which one, you know, what's the, what are the trade-offs that are being made. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also quite interested to see how Ethereum 2.0, or as it's called Serenity now, uh, how, their new shard, how their new kind of um, protocol will play out because they're, they're implementing sharding as well, along with a bunch of other protocol upgrades. And I'm also interested in seeing um, how uh, this technology called Plasma plays out. So Plasma is kind of like a layer 1.5 scaling solution. Um, it's kind of like side chains. You can, anyone can create their own blockchain that interoperates with the main chain, but it's secure in the sense that if that side chain misbehaves, then you can sim simply withdraw back to the main chain. And um, there's, like, there's like 50 different flavors of Plasma now, and it will be kind of interesting to see um, and lots of implementations as well. And it will be interesting to see who makes the first uh, practical application on top of it. So, um, University College London just opened their first blockchain program. I think it was earlier this year, I believe, or it was last year. And I was wondering, uh, as people who are already in that program, what is the research process on the inside? Do you guys come up with, 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 with the topic of the research yourselves? Or uh, do you work with, with the other researchers in, in, in UCL? Does UCL ever give you any direction into what they think you should be looking into? And uh, are you happy with that process? And do you think there's room for improvement? Well, what, well, what do you mean by program? Do you mean like, um, I mean, we, we've been doing research at UCL for more than a year now. So, um, but they just recently announced uh, their, their own separate kind of blockchain department, I believe. Uh, right, I saw the announcement. For blockchain technology. Yeah, exactly. Um, yes. <laughs> I, I <laughs> he was older than me. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, um, I, well, I, pe people often have a misunderstanding of what, what being a PhD student is. 
it's not really being a student. It's actually it's, it's basically a full time job where you're a researcher. Um, do it like it's not really that different to actually being a professor, except that you don't have to teach and you have more time to do actual actual <laughs> research. Um, and I think well. I can't speak uh, for, for Sarah, but because because ev- we have different su- academic supervisors. Yeah. But generally speaking, um, it's very flexible. So I, because my funding isn't tied to specific projects. So generally speaking, I choose what I want to work on, and I have a lot of flexibility in choosing what I, what 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 interests me, and also joining other projects within the group that um, interest me as well. So it. You mentioned that uh, it seems to me like you're, you almost want to focus more on the research and less on the teaching. And I was wondering, how are the students oh, when so it comes to blockchain? Are they interested in the technology? Is it difficult to teach on that topic? So, um, well, I, mean, I think you can talk about that because yeah. you did the yeah. TAing. Yeah, in exactly. I was going to say so. Yeah. Um, actually, this year yeah. for the first time, we're going to have a cryptocurrency class uh, at UCL and it's starting only next term. So I can't answer right now, but I can just tell you that next term at UCL for like the um, in a, like computer science student, we're going to have a cryptocurrency um, class. I would be very curious to see the course manual for that. Well, I mean, <laughs> we, we are <laughs> working on this. So my supervisor, Sarah Mekirjohn, is going to be the one uh, teaching it. And me and other of her students, we're going to be like uh, being like teaching assistant, as we call it. So, um, so they're going to be a syllabus uh, online. So maybe you can find some resources. But yeah, we'll be like covering um, a bit of everything. So the students can have an idea of like all the problem in the space from like the topology, you know, to the um, like uh, I mean, like network and consensus and uh, economic also argument. So we've kind of have like a, a big overview of um, of the whole space. So maybe we won't go, you know, into like too much technical details. For example, we won't, you know, see like the details of like Zcash and how this zero knowledge like cryptocurrency work. But at least students will get a good overview. And if they want to like keep doing research with us, uh, this will give them the opportunity to see what area they are interested in. Okay, so. so I'll tell you more maybe <laughs> <laughs> next time. I'll be reaching out. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. It's the first time we're doing it at UCL, so... Yeah, but we also, have cool. we also have master's students mm-hmm. who are doing projects on blockchain, um, whether it be writing smart contracts, for example, or more theoretical aspects. So, for my final question, I was wondering if you had to make a guess, what, how much time and under what, what circumstances would we be able to come up with a blockchain solution that is also a commercial grade type production so basically you can handle millions of transactions uh, want to start with you so so what's your question basically the question is uh, what's your timeline or at least what's your how how long do you guess it would take to reach to a point where we can securely scale blockchains to the point where they can process millions of tra- not millions of millions transactions of but millions, at least can serve yeah. millions of people uh, without any hiccups and can also keep them secure mm. and would there be a partic- uh, would there be a specific circumstance or condition or condition for that to happen? Well, I think, like, to be fair, in terms of uh, technology, I think we could reach that uh, level quite soon. I think that the main problem with having, you know, like, uh, you know, tens of, m- not millions, but like thousands of transactions is more like the mainstream adoption. And I think that even if us researchers, we come with like technical solutions that are going to scale well, there are still a lot of problems, for example, like usability and user experience, that's going to make it hard for everyone to um, to use blockchain. So I think that before we see like, uh, you know, B- Bitcoin or like any uh, other currency used, you know, like on a, you know, mainstream, like worldwide level, um, it will be more of a usability problem than actually a s- technical scaling problem, if that makes sense. So I think we'll, we'll solve this problem faster. I don't know what if you agree. Well, um, I'm actually very optimistic because mm-hmm. I kind of feel like as of now, all of the kind of major kind of core challenges of, of scalability mostly have answers to them now. Mm-hmm. Like we know, we, know how to do, we know how to do sharding now. We know how to do layer two scalability. We know how to do payment channels. We know how to do sketch channels. All of those things are kind of past research phase now. They're, they're now... In in the in the implementation and engineering stage, and um, lots of different projects are actually implementing it right now, mm. and some of some of that stuff is you can, you can play with it right now. Uh, there's test nets and whatnot, so I'm actually very optimistic, and I think I, I think one or two, one to two years from now we could see a very scalable blockchain. Um, even Ethereum, Ethereum's roadmap is one is about one year to release Serenity. Um, if you asked me two years ago, I, w- I would have been a lot more pessimistic because. I, I, I just didn't see how sharding could work, for example, securely. But now, um, 
I'm quite optimistic about it. And I think once we can actually, I think we, d we can actually have millions of transactions per second uh, using layer two solutions or layer 1.5 solutions. Uh, and I think um, that will actually make it much easier for usability to happen and, and for, for mainstream adoption to happen. Because I think one of the reasons why not right now that adoption isn't happening is because if you want to develop application on the blockchain, it's really expensive for the user to use. You have to pay huge transaction fees. So you can only really do an application on the blockchain if they're financial applications where there's a real need, where, there's a, where the user doesn't mind paying for that. So, and there's not, and so if you can have ma lots of transactions per second, then people can have lots of, lot m a lot more transactions, a lot more applications on the blockchain um, that, that are non-financial, for example. And I don't think, I, I don't think every application necessarily has to need a blockchain. Like crypto, I think CryptoKitties is a great application. <laughs> it doesn't need a blockchain, <laughs> but like, <laughs> it, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a, that's a very interesting way to end that talk, but yeah. I'm very happy you guys came here and joined us at Hard Fork Decentralized and you demystified some of the issues around scaling blockchains. We're going to be closing this session shortly and we'll be back in a couple of minutes. Please stay tuned with us.